Wild rice. It's Minnesota state grain, and I'll bet it means something special to a lot of you here today. Does anyone make wild rice for special occasions? Yeah. Okay, right. Um, who has a favorite wild rice recipe? Maybe a family recipe. Yeah, some of you here. Um, who has been out racing before? Okay, so I planted a few people. <laughs> here. But okay, so for those of you who don't know as much about wild rice, a lot of what's sold in stores is actually cultivated or farmed wild rice. The really wild wild rice, that grows naturally in shallow lakes and streams across the Great Lakes region, such as this one here. And you can see from the other picture, they really are different. Natural wild rice has this nice varied coloring, and its taste and its texture is quite distinct. And you can buy natural wild rice in stores. Next time you're shopping, just check the labels. Unfortunately, though, natural wild rice is highly sensitive to a multitude of environmental stressors. This includes fragmented habitats and high water levels, and it includes warming temperatures, interestingly, warming winter temperatures. Wild rice is vulnerable to different invasive and competitive species, and it's highly sensitive to water contaminants, such as sulfate, when it transforms into the toxic form of sulfide. And all this has led to the near decimation of wild rice in Michigan, as well as the impairment of many wild rice lakes and streams across Minnesota and Wisconsin. And when there's a problem for wild rice, there are wider implications throughout the ecosystem. Many waterfowl depend on wild rice for their food or for their breeding grounds. And so you can see that this sensitivity of our beloved state grain really is cause for concern. In fact, it can be devastating for Native Americans in the Great Lakes region. For them, wild rice is not only an important part of their diet, but it is central to their cultural identity. For the Anishinaabe or the Ojibwe people, their migration story revolves around wild rice. Their creator told them to go to the place where food grows on water. And so wild rice has been a it's been a sacred guiding food for them, for where they are today. And today, tribes continue to harvest and prepare wild rice, and wild rice plays an important role in their ceremonies. And today, tribes are sovereign nations whose access to wild rice is legally protected by treaties signed by the US federal government. So for all these reasons, wild rice really serves as a flagship for both environmental preservation and for indigenous resource sovereignty. Of course, for the same reasons, wild rice has also served as a flashpoint between tribes, industries that affect wild rice waters, and state agencies that regulate them. And this problem captivated me from the first time I ever heard about it when I arrived to Minnesota five years ago. I'm a hydrologist interested in how the movement of water and contaminants and the growth of plants interact with each other in ways that impact society. And so I began researching how the exchange between groundwater and surface water can affect the levels of sulfate and sulfide that accumulate around wild rice roots. But I began to realize that all my hydrological and geochemical computer models, they couldn't possibly tackle the full complexity of the problem, especially not when it comes to those sensitive cultural and policy issues. And so a couple years ago, I assembled an interdisciplinary team from across the university to examine both the ecology and the policy of wild rice, all under the consideration of its cultural importance to Native people. And we received a grant from the university's Grand Challenges Program in Institute on the Environment, and our aim has been to support tribes in their work to protect wild rice. So, we're about a year and a half into the project right now, so you're probably expecting that I'm gonna show you a bunch of plots and data from all these different wild rice lakes and streams that we visited, right? Well, actually, this slide. This slide showing our full project team with all of our students and all of our tribal collaborators. This slide is actually what best sums up our greatest achievements thus far. So let me explain. We started off the project with six letters of support from different bands and tribal organizations. So I've got to say, we, we felt like we were all set with our tribal partnerships. And so when we got our grant, we were ready to dive right into our research. But we could feel most of our tribal collaborators really hanging back. You know, this really confused us because hadn't they written us these letters of support? Well, they pointed out something to us that's gonna sound really obvious to you right now, but it's something that we, as researchers, too often forget when we are just so fixated on getting that data and getting those publications out. 
And that is, a true collaboration takes much more than just securing that letter of support. A true collaboration is a relationship among individuals, and it takes time, goodwill, and a lot of listening to develop. And this is especially the case when working with communities that have been repeatedly marginalized and have had their concerns ignored again and again. And so we did something that I certainly have never done before. We put aside our research plans. And instead, last spring, we traveled around Minnesota and Wisconsin, and we visited different reservations and tribal organizations. And we listened. We listened to what tribes were concerned about with wild rice. And we recruited a group of really bright native and non-native students, and I'm glad to see a few of them here tonight. They are proving to be invaluable bridges between our research team and our tribal partners. So what we have found is that with the very simple act of us listening, many tribes have been willing to do something that is not so simple, and that is to engage with us, even after so many negative uh, negative experiences that they've had with researchers. And so, that's why today, right now, I am honored to show you this list of individuals, which includes representatives from 11 different bands and tribal organizations, all of whom who expressly wanted to be named as a collaborator on our project. And there are many more beyond this list of people who have been willing to share their perspectives with us and help us really understand why they have so much to be wary about. And our project was given this Ojibwe name, Kawe Gada Na Na Gado and Manomen, to remind everyone on the project of these guiding principles that first, we must consider Manomen, or Psing in Dakota, or wild rice, because wild rice is profoundly important as both a natural and cultural resource for Native people. So just one year ago from right now, we had no idea if any tribes would want to work with us. But since then, we've been coming together to the table to hatch new research plans, and we've been going out together to learn about wild rice lakes and streams. But I do have to admit that establishing and maintaining a trusting partnership takes a lot of time, and it can be really hard work. But all of you already know this from all the important relationships that you have in your lives, right? And so you also know that all that effort is absolutely worth it. In our project, so far, we only have preliminary results, but it is already clear that a close collaboration with tribes is making our science so much better. You see, we started off with only three study sites in our original research plans. All were in northeast Minnesota, and they were chosen based on their levels of sulfate. Well, our tribal partners helped us realize that our thinking was too narrow. It was far too narrow if we actually wanted to figure out what the problem with wild rice, because it's probably a combination of all the stressors that I told you about before. But the stressors are different across the Great Lakes region. And so tribal resource managers from 10 different bands and tribal organizations helped us expand our view to include over 30 sites that they were concerned about. And these span a far more representative range of the hydrology, ecology, and management conditions out there. And our tribal partners, Eric Chapman and Joe Gravine from Lac de Flambeau, they put it best, I think. And we're actually fortunate to have them here with us tonight. So Eric is a, hi Eric. <laughs> Eric is tribal council member and the program director of the Wild Rice Cultural Enhancement Program. And Joe Gravine is a wild rice technician who is passionate about protecting wild rice for his people. They explained to us that Monoman, or wild rice, has no state or county boundaries on where it will grow and provide sustenance for our families in a healthy environment for the winged ones, the ones that swim, the ones that crawl, and the four-legged ones. We recognize Monoman as an indicator of healthy nibi, water, and hope this project educates our future generations on the importance of this gift from the Creator. So last summer, we were able to make it out to nine of our tribal partners' sites of concerns, five of which were located across four different reservations. And they included everything from 
from threatened lakes like this one where perennial competitive plants were just starting to appear, as well as sites that were already impaired, such as this stream reach that once had productive wild rice stands but no longer does not. Now I do have to pause here and make a very strong cautionary note. You might be thinking so far that the main advantage of working with tribes is site access. But that perspective of site access is fraught with colonial history. And more specifically, it has caused confrontations between researchers and tribes. In our project, what has been truly invaluable is not unilateral benefits of site access, but it's been the exchange of ideas and it's been those perspectives and insights that our tribal partners have been willing to share with us. They've been sharing with us the histories of these sites and they've been helping us find the best places to be collecting samples, all of which would have been just hugely challenging for us to do at so many different sites. But our tribal partners aren't simply introducing us to these sites, they're also intellectually driving the science there. Our tribal partners have come up with so many fascinating hypotheses that we never thought of. And these come in part from their close familiarity with their own lakes and streams. But it also stems from their cultural way of thinking about the environment altogether. And this is in contrast with our tendency in academia to isolate different components into different specialized uh, disciplines, which I'm beginning to realize can make us really myopic in our interpretations. For example, as a hydrologist, I usually only think about the movement of water as bringing in those contaminants that we find in lake, stream, in lake beds. Well, some of our tribal partners asked whether Airborne dust that settles into lakes could be another mechanism, especially in this one lake where we really haven't been able to figure out a hydrologic source. Here's another example. Early on, we drew a bounding box tightly around the aquatic system, and we figured we just had to figure out, we just had to resolve those different arrows inside. Well, a couple of our tribal partners asked whether we actually made sure we drew the box in the right place. They pointed out that at some of their lakes, the surrounding areas have been intensively logged or they're highly vulnerable to changes in tree cover. And they noted to us that changes in upland vegetation could be changing the lake levels nearby or, be, or they might be changing the amount of runoff of nutrients into them, both of which could negatively impact wild rice. So I can tell you that there's so many new hypotheses that our tribal partners have shared with us, but I'll give you just one more. Okay, so quite frankly, our team has struggled with stepping out of our comfort zones to think about things outside of our areas of expertise. And this has been an obstacle for doing interdisciplinary research that actually integrates biophysical science and social science. When we do try to stop talking with each other, we often end up really fumbling with each other's jargon. So I was really scratching my head with this one term. Okay, I'm looking at my hair. Okay, cultural epistemological frameworks, something like that, okay. Right? And at the same time, I was trying to explain this concept of chemical end members, even though to me it was like the most obvious thing in the world. So, okay, so here we are really struggling, right? But one of our tribal partners stepped right in and said, look, I'm really concerned about losing traditional harvesting practices and whether this could have a negative impact on our wild rice. So what he explained to us is that his elders always taught him to pluck out competitive plants during his harvesting breaks. But he's noticed that youth don't always learn to do this anymore. And he wondered whether this could be contributing to the worsening problem of competitive plants crowding out wild rice. And he wanted to think about how he could get youth in his tribe to attend ricing camps like this so that they can learn these important lessons that could help preserve their wild rice stands. So clearly, our tribal partners have no problem seeing these potential links between biophysical science and social science. So we really have a lot to learn from them about interdisciplinary science. Okay, so all these ideas that I've given you so far, they're still just hypotheses. We don't have the answers yet. And that's because the essential first step has been to establish a strong and trusting relationship with tribes. But one thing we do now know is that wild rice is profoundly important to native people. And when we as researchers can understand this, then we can begin to learn about the diversity and the complexity of these lakes and streams that have been part of their lives for generations. And we might understand aspects of the environment 
that we wouldn't have been able to figure out so easily on our own if we just use our usual academic approaches, which can be too often too narrow. So I'd like to end by noting that all these examples that I just gave you for how working with tribes really improves our science, they've all focused on the intellectual aspects of our work. But what does make good science? Is good science solely those innovative discoveries about physical mechanisms and chemical and biological processes? Well, I would argue that the definition of good science is more than that. I would argue that good science is also impactful science. It's findings that improve life conditions, equity, and the sense of identity within communities. So how do we do impactful science? Well, I'd like to thank our tribal collaborators for helping us figure this out, because I know it's going to be one of the most important contributions of this project. And we are privileged today to have a few of our close tribal collaborators here tonight. As I mentioned already, we have Eric Chapman and Joe Gravine from Lac de Flambeau, and we also have Karen Diver here, former chairwoman of Fond du Lac. And so I'd like to thank them as well as all of our tribal collaboration, collaborators for teaching us that when we want to do research for people, we must do research with people. We must really listen in order to understand what is truly important to them and to know what we must consider to make sure that we are doing our research in the most positively impactful, respectful, and meaningful way. So, miigwech. Thank you.